Welcome to WLC Radio, a subsidiary of World's Last Chance Ministries, an online ministry dedicated to learning how to live in constant readiness for the Saviour's return. For 2,000 years, believers of every generation have longed to be the last generation. Contrary to popular belief, though, Christ did not give believers signs of the times to watch for. Instead, he repeatedly warned that his coming would take even the faithful by surprise. Yahushua urgently warned believers to be ready because, he said, the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. WLC Radio, teaching minds and preparing hearts for Christ's sudden return. Literal or symbolic? It's important to correctly differentiate between the two because they're polar opposites. If you symbolise something that's supposed to be taken literally, you can find yourself in a bit of trouble, if not outright danger. However, if you take as literal something that's supposed to be a symbol, you can get ensnared in beliefs that are confusing and nonsensical. Hi, I'm Miles Roby, and you're listening to World's Last Chance Radio, where we cover a variety of topics related to scripture, prophecy, practical piety, biblical beliefs, and living in constant readiness for Yahushua, either in death or at his sudden return. If you've joined us before, you know that Dave Wright and I have long had a fascination with the book of Revelation. We've interpreted it literally, believing its prophecies are yet future, including the millennium. We believed that the millennium was the first 1,000 years following Yahushua's return. Well, after some intense study, we have come to realize that we were wrong. The millennium is actually a symbolic time period referring to the era stretching between Yahushua's ascension and his return. This position is called a millennialism. If you've never heard of it before, if you think we've finally gone insane, I want to encourage you to study it out for yourself. There is so much evidence to support this position. And quite frankly, after looking at all the evidence, I'm surprised I ever thought the millennium was yet future. We cover a lot of this in programme 254. It's called A New Look at Prophecy. If you missed that episode, you can still listen on our website. There's a lot of good information in there, and I know you won't want to miss it. If some of the terminology we use in today's programme is new and confusing, you can find it explained there. Again, it's Programme 254, A New Look at Prophecy. The thing I want to focus on today, though, is Revelation. I focused so long on interpreting the book of Revelation as a description of future events all related to Christ's return that despite being convinced that amillennialism is true and consistent with Scripture, I've still got some questions on what this all means, how this all fits in with the book of Revelation. Now, Dave Wright's been studying this for longer than I have. So today, I've asked him to share with us what he's learned about how amillennialism impacts our understanding of the book of Revelation. Dave, the stage is all yours. (laughs) Well, hello, and thanks for that, Miles. Yes, there are many reasons to believe that the entire book of Revelation, save for the, the final two chapters, has already been fulfilled. Even Mm. the structure of the book, how it's written, lends credence to the millennium being now, before Christ returns, and not afterward. Okay, so what do you mean by that then, if you could interpret? So how does the structure of how it's written support a millennialism? When you take a step back and look at the book of Revelation as a whole, you begin to see that the way it's written is in a style of what we call progressive parallelism. In other words, it covers the same events from one angle. Then, a chapter or two later, it backs up and covers the same events from another angle. And then, Mm. in the next chapter, from another angle, and so on and so forth. Now, that is called progressive parallelism. Sometimes it starts back at the same starting point, but not always. However, there is always overlap because you're looking at the same event from different angles. Okay, right. So so what time period is, is Revelation looking at then? Now. Oh, 
the time period between when Yahushua ascended to heaven and when he returns. Christians who believe in a literal thousand-year time period place the events of Revelation surrounding Yahushua's return, completely ignoring the events following his ascension and leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem, even though the destruction of Jerusalem was one of the Saviour's main prophecies. And you can read all about it there in Matthew chapter 24, Luke chapter 21, and also Mark chapter 13. Actually, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up believing that Yahushua would take the righteous back to heaven for a thousand years. I was taught the millennium would occur on earth after his return. Either mm. way, it's making the millennium literal and pushing it off until after Christ returns. Now, that's called premillennialism, the belief that Christ returns before the millennium. But when we see how Revelation is written in a progressive parallel style, constantly circling back to cover the same ground all over again from a different angle, it kind of undermines the idea that the millennium is literal and future. Yeah, I mean, that makes complete sense. A symbolic millennium also makes the most sense when you look at the highly symbolic language that is used throughout the entire book, but especially in chapter 20, where the millennium is referred to. Now, are you going to tell me that a dragon being bound in chains and kept in a bottomless pit is to be interpreted literally? <laughs> no, not really, no. And yet, that's the context in which we read about a millennium. If everything else in that passage is symbolic, why wouldn't the millennium itself be a symbolic period of time too? To try mm. and impose a literal meaning onto the millennium quickly becomes really awkward when you read it in context. It, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, well, could I actually just take a moment to read that? I'd like to hear what it actually says again, to be honest. Of course, absolutely. It's Revelation chapter 20, and uh, let's read verses 1 through to 3. Now, as you read this, Miles, ask yourself if everything in these verses could be symbolic except for the time period given, because that's how most people interpret it. Okay. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Now, as you can see, this is highly symbolic language. To insist that the millennium is literal, but everything else is symbolic, just doesn't make sense. Mm, okay, but then if, if Satan's binding is symbolic then, what does it mean? How was he bound symbolically? Well, he was unmasked. His power to deceive was restricted. It was bound. Right. You see, Calvary answers Satan's charges by revealing the true depth of the Father's love. But before then, even holy beings were confused and had questions. And you can see this in the story of Job. Satan accuses Job of obeying Yahweh for what he could get out of it. The fact that Yahweh allowed the devil free reign to test Job reveals that even among the holy sons of Elohim, there were some questions. They were confused. Can you see, after Calvary, anyone mm. falling for the same lies that Satan used back then? No, well, not really, no. That's because at Calvary, Lucifer's true character was revealed, and at the same time, so was the Father's. Now, of course, Satan can still deceive, but not to the degree he could before, and that's how he's been bound during this time period, the symbolic millennium. And this actually brings me to my next point. Amillennialism provides a better, more logical explanation of just what it means for Satan to be bound during the millennium. If you believe the millennium is a literal time period when the saints are in heaven after Yahushua's return, then what does it mean for Satan to be bound? Uh, well, just that he's limited to this earth. You know, he can't keep deceiving people because there's no one around to deceive if the saints are in heaven. So if there's no one around to deceive, then his binding is more physical. He's stuck on earth and can't leave. Yeah, I, I guess, yeah. Okay, well, when you go back and look at that passage, it doesn't mean that Satan is kept from doing literally anything. It's talking about his ability to deceive. His power to deceive is broken when he is bound. 
Now, if no one were around, then his power to deceive wouldn't need to be broken simply because, due to proximity, there'd be no one around to deceive. But that's not what this passage is saying. It's saying that Satan is prevented, he's bound, from spreading mm. spiritual darkness through his lies. Lies about what? Lies about Yahweh's character. That's where he was so successful prior to Yahushua's death. But since Calvary, that power has been bound. Well, well, why do you think Satan has to be bound in the first place then? Well, that's a very good question. The obvious answer is so he can't deceive. But a millennialism has a better answer. Let's go to Revelation chapter 19. This describes the return of Yahushua in highly symbolic language. Now, you've just read in Revelation chapter 20 that Satan is bound. Why? Mm. What does verse 3 say? Uh, so that he should deceive the nations no more. Okay, now go back one chapter to Revelation chapter 19, and from okay. there, let's read verses 19 to 21. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. When John wrote Revelation, there were no verse numbers, there were no chapter divisions. This was all added later. So let me ask you this, why does Satan need to be bound so that he can't deceive the nations in Revelation 20 when, right here at the end of Revelation 19, all the nations have been defeated and destroyed at Christ's return. Mm, doesn't make sense, does it? Not with our traditional understanding of the millennium, no. But once you understand that the millennium is actually a symbol for the time period that stretches from Yahushua's ascension until his return, once you understand that Revelation keeps circling back to cover all angles, it does make sense. Otherwise, no, it doesn't make any sense at all. Why would you talk about protecting the nations from being deceived in the opening of Revelation 20 when at the close of Revelation 19 you just said that the nations have been deceived and destroyed? Mm, good question, actually. I never realised I had so many holes in my beliefs before. Well, to be fair, neither did I. And that's mm. why we can't ever stop studying and decide that we know enough to be saved. We've got to study and keep on studying. Some advanced truths can't even be grasped until we give up foundational errors. Don't ever decide you know everything necessary for salvation. Once you do that, you stop studying. And that is not safe for anyone. Nobel Peace Prize winner Martin Luther King Jr. was an American minister famous for his social activism. He once wrote, quote, Faith is taking the first step, even when you don't see the whole staircase. Faith is crucial to a victorious Christian walk. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7, Paul states that believers walk by faith and not by sight. But do you know what that means? What does that look like in the daily life? What benefits does it bring and how can we make this a part of our spiritual walk? How can we make this a practical part of our daily living? To learn more, listen to the previously aired programme called Living by Faith and Not by Sight. That's programme 250, Living by Faith and Not by Sight. You can find it and other programmes focused on victorious Christian living on our website at worldslastchance.com. Just click on the WLC radio icon and scroll down. The longer you study Revelation with the understanding that the millennium is a symbol for the time period we're living in now, the time period stretching between Christ's ascension and his return, the more clearly you see how it fits with all of Revelation, tying it all together. A millennialism perfectly fits in a way that pre-millennialism, the belief that Christ returns before the millennium, simply doesn't. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, the more you look at this, the more I see where you have to stretch and, and twist pre-millennialism to make it fit all the parameters. But amillennialism, just, it just fits. It really does, yes. And the more you study the millennium from the angle of amillennialism, 
the more parallels you'll find that you don't see with pre-millennialism. For example, let's read verses 4 to 6 of Revelation 20. After John sees the devil bound for a thousand years, what does he see next? I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Yahushua and because of the word of Yahuwah. They had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of Yahweh and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now turn to Revelation chapter 6 and from there can you read verses 9 to 11. Okay. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of Yahweh and the testimony that they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer, until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. The logic of an amillennial position is clear when you recognize that both the passages are portraying the same thing. Revelation 20 talks about souls beheaded for their testimony about Yahushua and the word of Yahuwah. Revelation 6 shows souls who were beheaded for the word of Yahuwah and the testimony they maintained. There are clear parallels here that make sense with a symbolic understanding of the millennium which you just don't get when you try to insist the millennium is a literal time period. Mm, that's true. I mean, you miss the significance of these parallel passages if you make the millennium literal, don't you? There's another parallel that I want to point out, actually. Just go to the second chapter of Revelation and read verses mm -hmm. 10 and 11, if you would. Now, this okay. is from the letter to the Church of Smyrna. The believers in Smyrna were facing some intense persecution, so Yahushua sent them a message of encouragement. Let's read what the specific encouragement was, and this is in verses 10 to 11. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. The most interesting parallel between these two passages is that in both, believers are promised deliverance from the second death. Yes, they may lose their temporal lives in defense of the truth, but Yahweh will preserve them. He'll restore their lives when Yahushua returns, and the second death will have no power over them. That's a theme that we find in both passages. Revelation chapter 20 verse 6 says, Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, what's the last sentence of Revelation chapter 2 verse 11? The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. You miss this parallel if you're looking for a literal millennium. Now, another point. What's the reward of the martyrs in Revelation chapter 20? What do they get to do? This is in verse 4. Um, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony about Yahushua and because of the word of Yahuwah. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Okay, so those who overcome are seated upon thrones and reign with Christ. What does hmm. Revelation chapter 3 verse 21 say about those who overcome? It says, To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. So the martyrs of Revelation 20 are raised to sit on thrones with Yahushua. It's another parallel. 
Now, speaking of the word thrones, it's important to note that these are also symbolic. It's symbolic of the status of ruling with Christ in his kingdom. This is an important distinction. When Yahushua returns, he sets up whose kingdom? His own? Um. Well, no, 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 no. He, he sets up Yahuwah's kingdom, doesn't he? Exactly right. Yahuwah's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Yahushua's kingdom in which he reigns with the saints is the millennium. We're still speaking of symbols here. These aren't literal thrones in a literal time period. It's symbolic of the status that believers have as overcomers. They rule with Christ during the symbolic millennium, which, as we've said, stretches from his ascension until his return. Now, this may sound strange to people used to viewing the millennium as a literal time period, but Paul reveals that when Yahushua returns, he will transfer back to the Father all of the authority Yahuwah has given him. Therefore, the only time Christ could rule is before he transfers back that authority, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I guess, but, but where do you get this idea from then? Well, let's read it. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And from there, we're going to look at verses 24 to 28, please, Mars. Then the end will come, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include Yahuwah himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that Yahuwah may be all in all. Yahushua's rule ends when he turns the kingdom back over to the Father. He does this at the second coming. Consequently, the only time he could rule is before he returns, Again, we're dealing with the millennium as a symbolic time period. It's the only way for this passage in 1 Corinthians to actually make sense. Now, another point that is often overlooked has to do with the significance of the word first as it relates to the resurrection. Now, when I say first, what do you think of? Uh, well, something that comes before something else. Yeah, in time or in sequence. Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, or, or it could mean importance in rank. Excellent, yes. Now, when you look up the word first in the New Testament and you look at how it's repeatedly used in context, you find a fascinating nuance here that we've missed. The word first is used just like the word old to refer to our present world. The world we're in now is transient. It's going to be replaced by the earth made new. This is how first is used in the New Testament. It refers to our present world that is temporary. By contrast, second, or new, refers to the world to come, the earth made new, where everything will be permanent. Mm, I mean, it makes, it makes a lot of sense, especially in light of what you've just shared from 1 Corinthians. Even Yahushua's kingdom is temporary. Yahuwah's kingdom, once it's been set up, will last forever, just like Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar when interpreting his dream about the image. Let me just quickly find it on my screen here. Just one second. It's uh, Daniel... Daniel 2, chapter 2. Here we go. It's verse 44. It says, In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. Right. That's the future when everything will be complete and what is established will be established permanently. So in this context, the word first is not referring to an ordinal number that comes before other similar things that are being counted. Instead, the word first is actually drawing a contrast. We're not dealing with a simple numerical sequence. Instead, we're being shown a contrast between the first world, our present existence, and the second world, the earth made new when Yahuwah's kingdom will last forever. Now, apply this to what Revelation has to say about the first resurrection and the second resurrection. Okay. To be first implies something that is temporary in our present-day world. Whatever is second has permanence that doesn't exist in the first. The second is eternal, it's permanent, and it's experienced only after Yahushua's return in the earth made new. That's why Revelation tells us that those who have part in the first resurrection, those who surrender to Yahuwah in this first world, 
who put their trust in him are blessed. Revelation 20 verse 6 says that the second death has no power over them. Oh, I see. Yeah, I mean, that's a good thing because the second death is permanent. There is no resurrection from that. The first denotes transience. It's not permanent. The second shows permanence. And for those who have been taught to fear an ever-burning hell, right here, Scripture disproves that. The second death is permanent, as you said. There's no resurrection from the second death. Satan and all his followers will be punished with eternal death. Not eternal life in an ever-burning hell. Exactly. Suffering in an eternally burning hell isn't death. It's eternal life. And only the overcomers, only the righteous, will be rewarded with eternal life. The lost will be destroyed, never to come back again. That's what a just and loving God does to those who persist in rebellion. That is the second death. Hey, listen, don't go away, folks. When we return, I'll be answering your questions sent to us in our daily mailbag. Stay tuned. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio. When does the Sabbath begin? Would it surprise you if I told you that modern Jews and Saturday Sabbatarians are incorrect in beginning their Sabbath observance from sundown of the day before? It's true. One of Yahweh's holy days did commence at even on the day before, but it was never the seventh day Sabbath. To learn more about this fascinating, often overlooked but important part of doctrine, listen to radio programme 75 called The Surprising Meaning of Even. You can find it on our website at worldslastchance.com. Learn the true facts of even and discover when the Sabbath really starts. WLC Radio teaching minds and preparing hearts for Christ's sudden return. Today's question from our Daily Mailbag is coming from the country that gave us chess and wireless communication. Um, <laughs> um, uh, to be honest, I haven't a clue. Perplexed is the look you have on your face. It's the country <laughs> with the most vegetarians. There we go. That's a big clue. About 40% of the population don't eat meat, but they are the world's leading producer of milk. In trigonometry, they discovered the sine function, the cosine function, and the versine function. <laughs> wow, a nation of brainiacs, no doubt. <laughs> mm. Well, li listen, they were also the first to mine diamonds. They began this way back in about the 5th century BCE. Oh, um, uh, India. India, yes. So, out of all those other facts, you clue it into being India because of... Diamonds? Well, what can I say? You know, my wife does like the sparklies. <laughs> <laughs> I always knew you were a smart man, Dave. Uh, listen, you know what's important. I do indeed. Happy wife, happy life, indeed. <laughs> Very true. So, <laughs> now that we've cleared up that little one, uh, what is today's question? Well, Sajani from Jaipur has a question that I think dovetails with our discussion today. So she writes, I've been following with interest what you've been sharing about a millennialism, but it seems that all of your proof is drawn from the New Testament. What about the Old Testament? Does a millennialism agree with what the Old Testament has to say about the millennium? Well, you know what I love about this program, Miles, is the questions that we get here. Some fantastic yeah. questions that people take time to think about and ask us. And this one is a great question. Well, yeah, yeah. let's look at this. First, the Old Testament doesn't actually mention the millennium at all, not as a specific thousand-year time period. Now, there are passages that pre-millennialists believe are describing or referring to the millennium, but when you actually look at them in context, these passages are referring to events that have already taken place. 
While the Old Testament does not refer to a millennium as such, what the Old Testament does teach is most consistent with the belief that the millennium is symbolic. Okay, can you give us an example then? Yes, okay. Um, let's go to Daniel chapter 9, and mm -hmm. let's just read through this one. So Daniel chapter 9, and um, we're going to look at verses 25 through to 27. Know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the sixty-two sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Some versions translate sevens as weeks. They say there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Whichever way it's phrased, it's still referring to the same segment of time. It's prophetic time where a seven or a week refers to seven years. Now, you add 62 plus seven and what do you get? 69. Right. And the last seven or week refers to Christ's public ministry and the first few years after his ascension. That's why we call this the 70-week prophecy. Now, when you have 70 weeks, and each week represents seven years in literal time, how long is 70 weeks? I'm oh, just working that one out. It's 490 years. Exactly, yes. Now, this is mm. all very symbolic language, and it's referring to yeah. Yahushua, who in his public ministry and his death would usher in the final jubilee in the history of redemption. Jubilees commenced at the end of every cycle of seven years, or at the end of 49 years. 49 times 10 is 490. Now, this is interesting because in Scripture, a 10 indicates totality and completion. So this prophecy, pinpointing when the Messiah would come and what his work would be, is also revealing by the numbers used, a symbol of the plan of redemption. Once everything has been done, then the ultimate jubilee will commence with the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. There are so many layers of meaning when you look at this prophecy through the lens of amillennialism that you just don't get if you try to insist that the millennium is a literal time period. Okay, so we've got another question on this subject, and it's Georges from Koblenz in Germany, and wants to know, you teach that the millennium is symbolic, but that's a number. I was taught that numbers are always literal. Can numbers be symbolic? Again, a good question. Well, absolutely. Yes, they can. First, the millennium of Revelation chapter 20 makes more sense as a symbol because it's the only explanation that is consistent with the order of events at Christ's second coming. You can learn more about this in program 254. But to answer George's question, let's look at some passages of Scripture. As we go through these, you'll see that 1,000 is rarely, if ever, intended to be interpreted literally. It doesn't matter whether the context is temporal or non-temporal. Such as? Well, let's go to Psalm 50, verses 9 and 10. Can you read that one for us, please? Now, here, mm. this is Yahweh speaking. I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens, for every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. If we were to interpret this literally, we would say that Yahweh owns the cattle on a thousand hills, but not any of the rest of the cattle. Certainly not the cattle on grassy plains or in green valleys. But he's not speaking literally. Here, 1,000 is symbolic of everything. He's the creator, so everything belongs to him. In Joshua's closing speech to Israel, he used this same type of symbolism as a form of exaggerated hyperbole to illustrate his point. So, Miles, would you read Joshua chapter 23, verses 9 and 10 for us, please? Yahweh has driven out before you great and powerful nations. To this day, no one has been able to withstand you. One of you routes a thousand because Yahweh, your God, fights for you, just as he promised. So be very careful to love Yahweh, your God. 
In Deuteronomy chapter 1, when Moses was appointing elders to help him, he used this same form of symbolic imagery. In verse 11 he says, May Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, increase you a thousand times and bless you as he has promised. He does it again in Deuteronomy chapter 7. So could you read this one, please? Verse 9. Mm -hmm. Know therefore that Yahweh your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. So are we to take this number literally? Does this mean that if you happen to be born into generation 1001, whoops, too bad, so sad, you missed the boat and his covenant is not for you? <laughs> no. no. Of course not, no. The use of a thousand as a symbol was common in Bible times. Asaph, a psalmist, wrote a song recorded in First Chronicles chapter 16. Would you turn there actually for us and read verses 14 mm -hmm. to 16? Sure. It says, He is Yahuwah, our Elohim. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac. Another use of a thousand as a symbolic number. It's commonly used in prophecies, such as Isaiah chapter 60. So let's go there and uh, let's hear verses 21 and 22, please. Then all your people will be righteous and they will possess the land forever. They are the shoot I have planted, the work of my hands, for the display of my splendor. The least of you will become a thousand, the smallest a mighty nation. I am Yahuwah. In its time, I will do this swiftly. A thousand becomes a metaphor for completeness. Job uses it this way in his conversations with his miserable comforters. Let's take a look at what he says in Job chapter 9, and we're going to hear verses 2 and 3. But how can mere mortals prove their innocence before Yahweh? Though they wished to dispute with him, they could not answer him one time out of a thousand. You look at the verses where a thousand is used as a symbol, and it stretches from the days of Moses right through to Revelation. This was a commonly understood symbol in Bible times. John didn't feel the need to explain that it was a symbol because that's how his first century reading audience would interpret it anyway, and he, he knew that. Now, there's a lot more, but let's just look at one more for now. The Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 4. Here the king is praising his beloved using highly symbolic language. Okay, let's hear what he says. So, Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 4. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with courses of stone. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. It's so easy to get our minds stuck in a rut, to view things through a single pair of lenses, but we must study and keep on studying, always looking for which interpretations bring us the most consistency. And that is what we find when we take a long look at the millennium as a symbol. It's what is most consistent with Scripture. Oh, it's very, very interesting. I really do enjoy these questions. Uh, it brings nuances of this truth that I hadn't really considered before. So please do keep on sending your questions, your comments, your prayer requests. We always appreciate hearing from our listeners. Just go to worldslastchance.com and click on Contact Us. Up next is Jane Lamb with today's Daily Promise and some encouraging reassurance for those who may have drifted away from Yahuwah and are feeling too ashamed to return. Stay tuned. Today's Daily Promise is just for you. The world's three Abrahamic religions are divided on when to worship the Creator. Muslims go to mosque to pray on Fridays. Jews and Sabbatarian Protestants worship on Saturday, while Roman Catholics, the Orthodox churches and most Protestants celebrate the Lord's Day on Sunday. It's ironic, actually, that most Christians are quite unconcerned over which day should be observed. Oh, I worship every day, they shrug. I just celebrate Yahushua's resurrection on the Lord's Day. And that's good, so far as it goes. We should worship every day. But there's one more requirement for the day on which Yahuwah wants to be worshipped, and that is setting work aside. Besides, nowhere does Scripture actually say that believers are to religiously celebrate the first day of the week. That's a practice that came in with paganised Christianity in veneration of the sun. The Bible says we are to celebrate his death, burial and resurrection in baptism. 
which is certainly not a weekly event. It's definitely a war Satan is fighting hard to win. If you would like to learn more, listen to radio programme number 14 called The War for Worship. You can find it on our website at worldslastchance.com. That's The War for Worship, because when you worship does matter. This is Jane Lamb with your daily promise from Yah's Word. On July 22, 2024, it was reported that a tourist visiting London was bitten hard by a horse of the King's Guard. In the video clip, which was posted on YouTube and shown on a number of news websites, a group of friends is shown, one by one, sidling up to stand next to the horse and the guard riding it. As the women took turns, the horse gave several clear warning signs to back off, which the tourists ignored. Finally, the horse had had enough, and when the next woman stepped up next to him, he clamped down hard on her arm, jerking her entire body to the side. The woman received prompt medical attention from nearby police officers, but netizens who viewed the video were quick to ridicule the woman, saying she deserved what she got because directly behind her where she was standing was a large sign that said, in all capital letters, Beware! Horses may kick or bite. I think we can all relate to the cringy embarrassment that comes with doing something stupid. We're all human. We all make mistakes. We've all done something we regretted at one time or another. But the question then becomes, what do we do next? Well, if it's something we keep doing, even though we try not to, our emotions can quickly move to shame. We avoid the person we've wronged because we're too ashamed to face them. That's a problem when it comes to sin. You can't make yourself better away from Yahuwah. And yet our natural inclination when we've wronged our Heavenly Father is to cringe away from him in shame. That's what Adam and Eve did after they sinned. They hid because they were ashamed. If you've ever found yourself in this situation... I have got the perfect promise for you. You see, Yahuwah knows all about it. He knows that we don't want to face him when we know we've hurt him. So, he has provided a promise just for that. In Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 22, he says, Return, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. That's a powerful promise you can claim. He doesn't say... After you've stayed away and wallowed in shame for a month, then you can return. He doesn't say, return, and after I've lectured you and pointed out all your failings, then I'll forgive you. No, he simply says, return, now, and I will heal you. We have been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. One of Satan's most successful lies is that the divine law was nailed to the cross and is no longer binding. This error leads to another, which is the assumption that the Sabbath was meant only for the Jews. But the Sabbath is much more than some legalistic requirement. 
A deep dive into what Scripture says about the Sabbath shows that it actually reveals Yahweh's character. The Sabbath was never intended to be some onerous burden believers had to observe in order to be saved. It was always meant to be a blessing, an opportunity to draw near to Yahweh as he draws near to believers. Join Miles and Dave as they take a fresh look at Sabbath observance. Listen to radio programme number 16 called The Sabbath, Revealing Yah's Character. Once again, that's radio programme number 16, The Sabbath, Revealing Yah's Character. You can find it and other programmes about the Sabbath on our website at worldslastchance.com. I know we're almost out of time, but there are just a few more points that I'd like to make before we close. Amillennialism not only explains Revelation best of all, but it also ties in other passages of Scripture. It may sound counterintuitive to believers who've always been taught that the millennium occurs after Yahushua's return, but it really does make the most sense. For example, let's take a quick look at Acts chapter 15. Now in this chapter, the Jewish believers were insisting to the Gentile believers that the Gentiles had to be circumcised in order to be saved. There was a huge controversy on this point, as you can imagine. Peter actually spoke up against that, pointing out that they'd already seen how Yahweh had poured out his spirit on uncircumcised Gentile believers. Paul and Barnabas too were opposed to forcing the Gentiles to be circumcised. So let's see what happened next. Let's start reading. This is Acts chapter 15. We're going to read from verse 13. And can you go right the way through to verse 20, please? When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how Yahweh first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild, and I will restore it, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says Yahweh, who does these things, things known from long ago. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to Yahuwah. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. So what I want you to notice here is that in this context, the tent of David he's referring to isn't talking about the restoration of Israel as a nation in some future millennium following Yahushua's return. In this context, it's talking about Yahushua sitting on the throne of David at the right hand of the Father in this current age and the many souls that are gathered in from the Gentiles. That's happening now, and it's been happening ever since the gospel was taken to the Gentiles. This all makes perfect sense when you understand that this present age that we're living in when believers are being gathered in from the Gentiles is the millennium, a symbolic millennium. That's the epoch right now, and Acts 15 fits with that interpretation. It doesn't if you postpone the millennium to after Christ's return, but it does fit with the millennium and the gathering in of the Gentiles being the event that's occurring now. There's another New Testament passage that makes more sense when looked at through the amillennial lens. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. This is the faith chapter. It starts out saying, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Then it goes on to name various believers through time who had faith in and trusted the promises of Yahweh. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to start at verse 8. And can you go through to verse 10, please? Okay. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is Yahweh. What city is this talking about? Jerusalem? Israel wasn't even a nation yet. No, oh, well, oh, the new Jerusalem. Correct, yes. Verse 16 ah. states that Yahweh has prepared a city for believers. 
That city, of course, is the New Jerusalem, which Revelation 21 tells us Yahweh will move to earth after the earth is made new. This all fits with the amillennial understanding that when Yahushua returns, it's all over. The righteous will be raised to receive their eternal reward, while Satan and everyone who has joined in his rebellion will be destroyed. That happens when Christ returns, not a thousand years later. Then the earth will be made new, and Yahweh will move the new Jerusalem to earth and set up his everlasting kingdom. So you're saying that Hebrews 11 reveals Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all understood that Yahweh's promise to them of a land where they could settle in uh, would not be fulfilled in our current epoch, but would reach its ultimate fulfillment when the city whose builder and maker is Yah is set up on earth. That's correct, yes. In right. fact, the author of Hebrews says that's why they dwelt in tents. Now, this is an interesting detail, actually. Abraham was incredibly wealthy. He had the respect of kings and princes. He could have purchased land and built a city to leave to his posterity. But the author of Hebrews says that they all dwelt in tents. Even though they were in the promised land, they dwelt in tents as a statement of their faith in what was yet future. Yahweh's eternal kingdom that won't be set up until Yahushua returns. Okay, right. So, so they weren't looking for the fulfillment of the promise in their day. Not only in their day, but they weren't looking for it to be fulfilled at all until Yahweh's eternal kingdom is set up. All of this is consistent with amillennialism. That's pretty powerful, that is. I mean, never really noticed that before. So thank you, Dave, for bringing that up on these overlooked passages. No, it's really fascinating to see them in a new light. Well, just one final thought I'd like to leave you with. Scripture okay. says that not even Yahushua knows the day or the hour of his return. Only the Father knows. Now, this is significant. We know when the millennium started. It started when Yahushua was seated at the right hand of Yahuwah after his ascension. However, we don't know when the millennium will end. We know that Yahushua's return marks the end of his reign and the start of Yahuwah's reign. It's been almost 2,000 years since Yahushua's ascension. This mm. means that the 1,000 years has to be symbolic. The time period has already gone longer than 1,000 years, and the fact that it's been 2,000 years is consistent with various parables that suggested there would be a delay. All of this is consistent with Scripture when you view the millennium as symbolic. Mm, which is a really, really good point. Well, our time is up for today. Again, as I said before, if the topic of the millennium being symbolic and Revelation's prophecies being mostly fulfilled is new to you, I just want to invite you again to visit our website. We've got lots of articles studying this subject. It's a new one to me as well, but now that I've been studying out for myself, I'm absolutely and well and truly amazed I could ever have been believed in anything different. So check it out and let us know what you think in the comments section. If you'd like to share this program, it's called Program 255, Revelation and the Truth About the Millennium. So again, that's Revelation and the Truth About the Millennium, Program 255. We want to thank you for joining us today and hope you can join us again tomorrow. Until then, remember, Yahuwah loves you and he is safe to trust. You have been listening to WLC Radio. World's Last Chance is an online community founded in 2004 we are dedicated to spreading the gospel of the kingdom of Yahweh to the world. We are not affiliated with any denomination or religious organization. The foundation for our beliefs is the Bible and the Bible only. We believe in one God, and that is Yahweh, our Father and Creator. He is the only being that has immortality, natural and underived, and He alone is God. We believe Yahushua is his only begotten son. While Yahushua was perfect and lived a sinless life, he was also fully human. He had to be in order to die for the sins of the world because divinity cannot die. We believe the gospel is the good news of Yahuwah's kingdom that will be set up on earth when Yahushua returns. Contrary to popular opinion, 
it is not possible for anyone to know when the Saviour's return is near, Yahushua repeatedly warned that his return would be unexpected and like a thief in the night that would take even believers by surprise. Therefore, every believer should, by Yahweh's grace, live in constant vigilance, ready for the Saviour's return, whenever that will be. We believe that every human being has sinned and fallen short of Yahweh's ideal. Scripture teaches it is not possible to reach a state of perfection so long as we still have fallen natures. However, through faith in the atoning merits of Yahushua, believers are declared righteous. This is justification. Sanctification is the process by which believers are transformed into the divine image. This is a work the believer consents to, but it is a work performed entirely by the Father. He is the one responsible for writing his law on the human heart and putting a new spirit within us. The process of sanctification is completed at the Saviour's return. At that time, all who have accepted salvation by faith will be gifted with higher natures and given new glorious bodies. We believe that prophecy is Yahweh's gift to believers. It provides irrefutable proof of the divine origins of Scripture, as every single fulfilled prophecy has been fulfilled in exacting detail. We believe most of Scripture's prophecies, including the Olivet Discourse, recorded in Matthew 24, Mark 13 and Luke 21, as well as most of the Book of Revelation, have already been fulfilled. We do not ask anyone to believe based on our word alone. Rather, we invite you to use our presentations as a launch point for your own study. You can trust Yahweh to keep your mind safe as you study to learn the truth. So, be a Berean, study for yourself. Yahweh has promised to lead you into all truth. have been listening to WLC Radio. This programme and past episodes of WLC Radio are available for downloading on our website. They're great for sharing with friends and for use in Bible studies. They're also an excellent resource for those worshipping Yahweh alone at home. To listen to previously aired programmes, visit our website at worldslastchance.com. Click on the WLC Radio icon displayed on our homepage. In his teachings and parables, the Saviour gave no signs of the times to watch for. Instead, the thrust of his message was constant vigilance. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message as we explore various topics focused on the Saviour's return and how to live in constant readiness to welcome him when he comes. WLC Radio, teaching minds and preparing hearts for Christ's sudden return.